Bonsoir, bonsoir, bonsoir. Comment ça va? Ça va bien ou ça va comme ci, comme ça? Très bien. Il est inutile de vous dire ma joie, bien entendu. Simplement, avec votre permission, je voudrais vous raconter une toute petite histoire. Comme ceci. C'est autour de moi ta voyage Me trouve à l'étranger Un monsieur en son langage Gentiment un jour m'a demandé Allez-moi donc la vie lumière Paris est vraiment si joli Quand le dit unique sur la terre Simplement j'ai répondu ceci Et bien voilà Paris C'est de le petit matin le plus joyeux refrain De tous les petits moignons de Paris Et bien voilà Paris Pour aller au boulot C'est de prendre son métro Et de bien s'en passer à sa vie Et bien voilà ce sont ces gens pressés qui courent de tous côtés, mais qui sont heureux d'être Paris. Et puis, quand vient la nuit, c'est la pousse de taxi, de petits bas boîtes de nuit, et puis toutes les lumières de Paris. Voilà Paris. Hey, I think we're ready to go. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining us today. Welcome to Museum of the African Diaspora. That music was by Josephine Baker. I think it might be a cover, but it's from 1955 and it's called Voila Paris. And so the reason why we're playing that song is because I think France is gonna come up a few times today because a lot of artists have gone to Paris to practice their art. But we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Um, so my name is Today, and I am with my colleagues Dimitri Remy and Aswan. And um, Moad's Mo physical building may be closed due to the mandatory shelter in place, but you can still get your fill of art and artists of the African diaspora every other Thursday at 2 p.m. TST. You um, and we invite you to join Moad Docents as we look at art with with curiosity and wonder. We contextualize the art and discuss the artist, the art form with you and say whatever wonderful thing comes, comes, that comes to our minds because this is our art, we see it. We will follow all talks with an, um, an audience Q&A and also you can chat with us as we go. In this week's art as we see it, Moad Dosen's look at drawings and paintings of, um, of portraits. They we searched several, several uh, public domain archives to bring you selected portraits that highlight Black artists and Black subjects. You are, of course, invited to join our conversation via chat um, as we discuss aesthetics, cultural context, and anything, really. And I hope you enjoy your time with, with us, and we look forward to your contribution to the discussion in the chat. If you are joining us from Facebook, please leave a comment and we will jump in and out of Zoom to, um, to check on you. And I, I do have to say a little bit about why we chose this and why we chose the portraits that we're showing today. And um, all the portraits are of um, either, by, either by Black artists or the subjects are Black, but they're the central focus. They're not in service. They're not in the background. They're not hiding. They're not... Um, and after thought, they are the actual chosen subjects or they have painted themselves. So that's why we celebrate these portraits and that's why we brought them to you. Before I can get too ahead of myself, um, I would like us to be in silence as we stand in solidarity with Black Lives Matter.
As many of us are settler, immigrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this continent, our, our institutions were founded upon exclusions and erasures of indigenous people whose land we are located. With deep respect, Moad acknowledges that even in virtual space, our people, our work, and our network servers are on native lands. And thank the indigenous people of the Bay Area who have supported this land throughout the generation. Okay, the first portrait that we are gonna start off with is um, Henry Osawa Tanner's mother. And this is, this is such, I don't, I, I think we're gonna talk a little bit um, about Henry also as an artist and as an American artist, trained um, artist in America and also and in the US also in Paris. And why he went to Paris is such an important topic. And uh, when we talk about him, we also have to talk about the, the portraits of African-Americans at the time and what he was trying to do. Yes, he started out with, you know, his father really wanted him to be a, a religious um, practitioner. He was, you know, his father was a, a priest. He wanted him to be, to follow kind of his path. Um, but Henry, I, you know, at the age, at the very er, early age, like kind of 18, I guess, he really wanted to become a, a marine, marine artist, like painting water. And he thought that was really necessary. Later on, he started painting animals because he was like, okay, there's a shortage of people that are painting uh, zoo animals. Um, but also later on, he was, he, he really felt deep responsibility to paint African-Americans, to, to show African-Americans, not in, as a cartoon, as a caricature, as a negative or as a, an afterthought, but really uh, the way that he's showing his mother. And when we're talking about his mother, um, she, she, had, she had a hard time. Um, his father, not so much. He, was, uh, he came from a family um, he came from a family that was freed later on, uh, I mean, uh, earlier on, but the mother, the mother had suffered a lot of hardship and she had made sure that, she made sure that her children were raised to, to become like Henry taught, to, to, they were very educated, they were um, in, you know, very well cultured and here it is, he's capturing his mother. And I think we see so much, we see so much uh, into this painting. And so I'd like to invite the docents to chime in about, um, um, to talk about this painting. I mean, do we see that red repeating all throughout? Let's go. Yeah, for, for, for me, when I, when I first um, saw this particular portrait, um, what struck me particularly were her eyes mm -hmm. and the, the, the way that they are cast down and made me wonder what she was looking at and what she was thinking about as she became central focus. Mm -hmm. Because it seems like from her story, she was in the background a lot trying to nurture and push her family where now she's center stage and so I, I it makes me wonder what that might have been like for her um, and then the other thing that that uh, I feel really interested in is the little um, jewel or decoration around her neck mm -hmm. um, whether it's a pendant or or part of the clothing I feel it, I always just, I find it fascinating that it seems like it's white, but it's also like this color and it could be a uh, clergy color. So I, it's, I just feel like that's something that's maybe consciously crept in into, mm -hmm. the, in, into her painting. Uh, the fact that the family was quite um, spiritual or religious. I, I'm not sure how she would have described it at that time. Yeah, I think also, you know, it's, it's, I, I, 
we kind of looked into this portrait and um, that, you know, that, that this was something that he kept with him and that he mm. really, it, it brought him love and joy and made him feel close to his mother. And, you know, I, I think for me, you really, you really have to take it out of contemporary context where, you know, where we smile and we expect a warmth out of, <laughs> and, you know, fr from a portrait of someone that we really love and, and care for. And, you know, the, the way that her gaze is, is down, um, puts her at a, at a higher, um, you know, kind of place than whoever the viewer is. And, um, you know, and, and she's not smiling. And so, you know, from, a 2021 perspective of looking at it. This isn't how you would imagine your warm, loving mother, but you know, mm -hmm. you have to also put yourself into that Victorian context of, of folks not smiling because it shows that you're serious. And like you said today at the beginning, separating um, from the caricatures that were so common during this time to show that, no, I'm really serious. I, I, I do respect myself. I see myself, I've, I worked a really hard life. Um, and everything that I have is because I've, I've earned it. And so showing yourself very seriously and, and that being something that he um, elevates also because that helped him along his path, that, that sense of, of purpose and duty. Um, there's also a lot of texture behind the painting. And we had spoke of the red coming through some of that and if that had been in place at first, but almost like there's images behind. It could have been repurposing the canvas. It could have been intentional or um, just providing texture, but it um, really adds, um, and I don't know if it's the technique itself, um, an interesting quality is, um, and dimension to the, the uh, painting. Um, she does look stern, um, and we don't know how old she was at this time, I don't think. But um, again, like you were saying, uh, the seriousness could um, equate itself to dignity. Um, it, it, it's interpreted during those times, so it's a uh, yeah. That yeah. yeah. <laughs> he, you know, yeah. he was he, he painted uh, re religious. He went back to painting uh, figures from the Bible, and so he, he, later on he just started painting figures from the Bible. And he came back to the U.S. and uh, when you know he was experiencing the Harlem Renaissance, he was just like he was wondering why people were not painting. He wanted more artists to paint. Um, images of African Americans, the life of Amer African Americans. But early on, it, this, there's so much contrasting about his life, but I think this one is that, that honest, pure mother, kind of this is my family, this is my mother painting. But you know, he was at first, he was painting water and then he, he was a landscape painter. Then a little, um, a little further, he, when, he, when he went to Paris, and um, he was painting portraits and other things. And he was pretty well known in Paris. In fact, that in, in, in the US, one of the things that I, I read that he mentioned is that in the US, he was, um, a, he was mentioned in the newsletter and other places uh, where these exhibitions were announced as a Negro artist. Whereas in Paris, as many artists would say, he was Monsieur Tanner. He was an African, um, I mean, I'm sorry, he was an American artist, period. Um, and so he, I think all throughout his life, you can, you can kind of see this conflicting, uh, conflicting thing about being religious, being part of kind of uh, showing, I guess, going back to what his father would have liked of him, is to, become, to show uh, his religious side, and then going back to um, like, okay, I'm, I'm just gonna do that for now. And so it's, it's I, I really, really like this painting because of all the other paintings of Tanner that we know. This one is a, such an, a window to his intimate um, kind of, you know, how I can't imagine a closer image than, than his own mother. 
And so I, I really enjoyed this one. For the next one, I would actually really like us to, to just look at the art before we hear anything about it. It's this one. Oh, that's beautiful. I think my sound is muffled. Is it any better right now? I don't know who's taking the lead on this one, but the first thing that comes to me is just, she's just absolutely gorgeous and regal. And, you know, and, and what is, and then, and I forget, what is the date on this? Isn't this like 18th century? It is, it is pretty early. I, you know, um, uh, I, I just wanted to show, I just wanted to show all the work and then go back to actually it is 1895. Mm. And not only is it 1895, this is, this is in Europe, right? So this is in Europe and we're in, he's a, um, Asbe is a Slovene painter. And this art has caused a lot of conversation. One, because I think just that, just what we just observed is that it being, it looks so modern. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I do not, um, had I not seen the label, I would have thought that was, this was painted kind of maybe 70s, 1970s in the U.S. because mm -hmm. of the hair. Yeah, the hair makes it, I yeah. think the hair makes it modern. I also think the colors that are being used, and I think when we talked about this um, before prepping for this show, um, I think, Dimitri, you talked a little bit about the pigments that would have been available to people at this period in time. And I think, um, and, and certainly a lot of the European art that we look in the same period is often, and the Rembrandts is often this dark, dank browns and greens and, and you know, everybody looks like they're, you know, depressed. But this with, this is, just has so much light and so much beauty. And, you know, she could have literally walked off, off of any major, um, TV show of the 70s or the to the 90s or any uh, catwalk from from uh, from Paris to Milan and and mm. um, also she just looks like so many of the women in my family as well. Mine as well. <laughs> Not me yeah. so much, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I think also it's just just like from this period, you know, eight things just thinking of 1895 and what was happening throughout the rest of the world, you know, in the United States, we we're deep in the middle of Jim Crow, um, you know, and 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 to see a black subject painted so lovingly and mm -hmm. so regally, like with so much care, you know, that that bright orange, which which I'm imagining, you know, I'm not an expert on pigments, but you know, I did look into, you know, when things like cadmium um, red start to become um, popular and it's around this time. So, you know, he is taking these. And so to what Remy was saying before, a lot of the natural pigments came from like ochre and minerals that you find and you would grind down and that would be your pigment. So, um, you know, a, somewhere around this time, um, the, the use of using heavy metals, which are much more complicated <laughs> to work with, um, start to work their way into the pigment. But the way that he um, uses the orange, which which um, melanated skin has undertones of oranges, it's not undertones of pink, you know, with European, uh, you know, subjects and, and there's yellows. And so he has taken this, this orange and this yellow and, and he if you look at her skin, you can see where he has it shining through and then he really just lets it explode into the background. So it's a very, very contemporary um, use of the color and the pigment. And, you know, this shows some care about this subject who we don't know what her name is. We don't know 
who she was, but he obviously held her in high esteem. And, and I feel like the other thing with the hair, which is very different from Europe to, to what was going on here in the Americas, the, to me that just symbolized so much freedom. I mean, even now to wear our hair loose like that is still a, a, a major statement of freedom. Um, the, at that, the same time, a lot of the hairstyles here in America were being pushed to more, more of the, like they were experimenting with the straightening products and, 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 and things like that to try to feel more assimilated into if, if that's a word that I, I hate I don't like that word but it's it you know yeah, yeah so but just really looking at the hair and for me that just expresses how free um she must have felt to just really truly be herself yeah I like I also agree with the hair I, I love its natural look um when I first saw this, it was sort of a Grace Jones type of, yeah. when we mm -hmm. look at timeless, sure. you know, but it's the using natural, the beauty of natural hair and um, the artist captures that well. And it, it looks like her lips are uh, pursed, I guess is what you might say, but like she's about to say something is the other thing that I noticed. Um, and she's not looking at us, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I wonder, is she in thought or um, yeah. reflecting or uh, getting ready to communicate something? I also love the textures of the things that, um, uh, uh, either the garment that she's wearing, it's soft and, you know, it really softens the, the picture. And of course, uh, also the background is just really, um, and how the background colors are integrated into the, the portrait is really uh, beautiful. Yeah, I, I'm just now noticing like the eyes and it, I see that orange. I see that orange in the eyes as well. And, and also, you know, let, let's be honest, to get at that time for a non-black, he's not a black um, artist, but to get it to that level of, um, of detail and to, to show what black skin really looks like, to, to show how light falls on, on black skin, where um, that brown, all of it is just, I, I think it's such a, a genius work. There is, it, she, she could have been um, a council, a council, a US council's wife in Munich. There's a lot of anticipation, about, like a lot of guess about who is this woman is. If anyone knows so that's, that's um, here, please let us know. That would be really great. You can email us, let us know if you find more about um, this portrait for sure. But there's a lot of specula speculations and we really don't know. Um, I think uh, the last thing is. I wanted to say really about, yeah. you know, First of all, the incredible skill level of this mm. particular artist in terms yeah. of handling lighting. But not only that, but the, I, I think we don't often think about the skill level of the model, of the subject, mm -hmm. to mm. be able to sit and hold and, and be in your own sense of beauty and being in order for somebody else to capture it. Is, yeah. uh, is also another skill I think often gets missed because we often talk about the skill of the painter or photographer, but mm. there's always the skill of the model who, who and, and something like this, they probably, she would have probably had to sit for hours because it's not a case of he was painting from a photograph. Exactly, you know? yeah. Um, and you know, so I wonder, I, I wonder Remy, like had there been um, ear, um, jewelry, any kind of jewelry, had there been jewelry, would have, would have had, I don't know, for me, it's like, okay, a painting from 1970s, 1960s is what I would have thought from the US, what is whatever, if I didn't see the label, right? And then I'm thinking again, would we have another hint about the time period had we had jewelry or had we had, I don't know, what, what would have given, a, a given um, us, I guess, a hint of the times, uh, those times 
I, I don't know. That's just my mind kind of going into, into these details. Now where I, okay, the, the next one, the next one, again, I would like us to really look at, and I've shuffled things around, so I'm so sorry for the docents. <laughs> Dimitri's like, yeah, you did, you messed up. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's so, fine. Um, so, you know, the next one, I, 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 again, I would like us to take a look at um, before we start talking about it, just, just take it all in, and then we go into um, the details. Lord, that baby <laughs> gets me every time. So, you know, this is sort of like counting sheep for me. Like, I, how many things can I find in this painting? This, this is, um, this is a full painting. This is filled with things. Filled. I can take each corner, um, or we can take each item and really analyze it and look at it and focus on it. Zoom. Look at the brush stroke. Look at the color used. Look at the light that's falling on it. Um, there's just so much going on in this painting. This painting is, is by Palmer Hayden. He's an African-American painter. Again, I think Hayden also ended up in Paris, right? I think he also had ended up in Paris. He was self-taught. Um, he was self-taught, but deliberately making, also deliberately making his, um, his subjects sort of, he exaggerates them. He has kind of these dull, um, flat characters in his paintings that he just sprinkles here and there, uh, whether it's it's the baby, <laughs> what is the baby on this one, or that, um, or maybe even the woman, I mean, I think the woman is the lively one here, but here he paints an, an artist painting and he, he's a, a, a janitor. Now we know that he's not, a, he wasn't a janitor. Hayden was not a janitor, but he did have a hard time in life in the beginning as most artists do, uh, and he <laughs> financial troubles and otherwise at that time, I guess. And, but he had, I think he, he calls it the painting of protest. And this one, he, he it's a protest painting for him. It's this that he's trying to capture the struggling artist, but we also know that he had a friend who, who who's an older friend, a mentor of his, that's a black artist as well, who was a janitor and who went home and painted at the time. We're not entirely sure that is actually what he's trying, what he's showing us. And um, Hayden is quite a character, honestly. And I and um, I would ask folks to really go out there, read about a lot of the things that he um, he tried to achieve in his paintings. He this painting was repainted um, to kind of ch change a few things, but. I, I would leave it to the docents. I can talk about this painting for a while. This was Charlie's favorite, so I'm sad that he's not here today. <laughs> yeah. I love this painting, and I love that you know we were able to uh, tap into it because there's just so, like you said, there's just so much going on, yeah. and you know I think by him cramming so much into the frame, you know, we get a sense that, you know, there's a broom and a feather duster um, hanging up in there. And the, the trash can is the first thing <laughs> that we see that maybe, you know, he's using it to, to rest his, his uh, palette and his brushes on or, or whatever it may be. Um, and, and so just the way that he's composed it, you get a sense of like, um, 
yeah, like being like being an artist, the, the typical um, image that we have of the artist who, you know, has to oftentimes have a day job and squishes in um, their studio space wherever they can be. And in this place, it's his, you know, broom closet slash uh, apartment or whatever it may be um, that, that he's got going on in, in this space. And the characters are just so unreal. Um, <laughs> You know the representation especially i think especially of the woman and the baby it feels like he put more painterly um emphasis on the painter himself like the way that he's rendered the the shirt you can see the breast strokes in it um it's, it's just it's just a really fascinating um painting that i feel like i could stare at for hours and and you know constantly see something new um and, and, and I think in, in so many ways, he's really just showing his full set of talents. Like if you look at the, the broom and the feather duster in the background and you look at that, just that section, you can see how masterful um, his style is. And then other areas, he kind of lets it flatten a little bit more. Um, so it's just a really, it, it, it's almost like everything that he does as, a, as an artist made its way into this one painting. Can we, yeah. can we, I have an honest question that I need honesty <laughs> at this one. Composition. So what, what, you know, how do you feel about composition and perspective in this painting? Was it intentional? Um, I just, I just want to throw it out there. And Remy, you were going to say something, but I'll go back to that. I, I think I was about to say the same thing in terms of the <laughs> composition and how, whether it's deliberate or otherwise, how he's using the composition to underline the overcrowded situation in which he finds himself. You know what I'm saying? It's like there's stuff in the back, there's stuff at the side, there's stuff in the front. There's, I mean, like there is so, so full. Um, and, and so I wonder, you, you know, how much of that was a social comment to the overcrowding situations in which a lot of people found themselves living because they weren't able to necessarily rent. They might have to have a couple of families renting in or living in a, a small space. I certainly know that that was a lot of the cases in England and certainly even in the 60s as black people, we couldn't rent anywhere. <laughs> so several families were having to share a house. And I don't know if this is that same thing, but that's kind of what it brings to mind and whether he's using mm. position to actually to his advantage to ex to expel that to expound upon a, that story yeah and and i i agree with you remy i i um also feel that um he's telling the story of the artist that he's painting mm. and um sometimes your environment tells the story so he has um crafted this piece to you know, artist is obviously married, has a child. Um, the tools of his his other his his work that he does for a living are right there in the front. Um, you know, we see the again, like as Remy was saying, we see the um, closeness or the small apartment size that you know it's in the basement I think we pointed that out it looks like um, but just all the little details seem to have a story mm -hmm. you know if we know the if, if we know what the story is I, I was curious as to the painting I didn't know if that was a person holding a child or if that was a cat if that was a painting of the cat in the back in the back, uh, it's the cat with, oh, that, yeah. with the blue that is, background. That, that is the cat because the cat's on the on the floor. So you know, um, you know the wife, and then just a little details. The the yeah. wife uh, was that gingham? Is that a gingham? yeah? It, lo it looks like, like that, that little right? brooch. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the child's staring intently. <laughs> that's a, oh my god that's, well, what that's a tonight. good word for it I that's know. a good word the baby is a little scary <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're not going to beat up on the baby today but no, we're not you're right her, her, we already did that her makeup as well mm -hmm. which i think is really incredible that she's wearing the black eyeliner you can see you can see like the mascara and the lipstick and the earrings and the fact again yeah. Yeah. she's obviously 
you know, dressed for this occasion um, to, to sit there. It looks also like that she has nail polish on her nails. So again, I think all of these little tiny hints give us clues into every everything. The baby's very intense. <laughs> the mama at is the artist. Yeah. The, the artist, the way he's looking out the side of one eye, you know, he's got the side <laughs> eye going on. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, I love this painting. I, there's, there's an artist that she's a little bit more caricature. Mm -hmm. I think she's a, 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 a white artist called Beryl Cook. And she has a little bit of this stuff going on in her, her work, especially the shoes that, that reminds me of her work. But the floorboards, if you look at the, the wooden floorboards, I mean, this this has spared no detail has been mm -hmm. un, un um, examined of his life. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, there's sorry. a comment from one of the audience members. Wendy says it's a slight, oh, this, it's a slight overbite for me, a crucial mm -hmm. facial, facial detail I've seen in reality, but never in a painting. Oh, wow. I want to go back and, and take a look at that. Um, oh yeah, the woman's, Right. Oh, I yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I think for me also just kind of, I always like to contextualize thinking about history and what's what's happening at this moment in time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's circa 1930. So, mm -hmm. you know, is this, is this Great Depression or is this, you know, it's during the Harlem Renaissance or, you know, kind of like the end of it. And just kind of thinking about how all the European you know, big movements are starting to happen in the 1910s and 1920s. And then you start to get, you know, during this period, the Harlem Renaissance and African-American artists coming up with their own style, you know, looking at the European styles, but, but trying to define um, what, was a, what was an African-American aesthetic at the time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, again, I think, I think that's where we start to see him playing with so many different styles as he's like, um, trying to define what is this African-American aesthetic that does not rely on whatever Europeans are thinking. You know, primitivism and cubism is such this big thing at this time. And, um, you know, African-Americans are, are pushing away from that as to like, okay, you're looking at our ancestry for um, inspiration for the styles of the most popular art. What is our own that that's separate from you? And so, you know, that's kind of what I get from this this painting as an artist working through like what is my visual language? Yeah, and and, and beginning to tell a uh, a story that's not just either a portrait or a landscape, a real, you know, driving a a, a painting that drives a real narrative mm -hmm. as well and tries mm -hmm. to record every day experiences that is so true and you know what we should we, we i uh, we we i wish we had loaded half an hour for this one but we have so <laughs> many ahead of us and rami this this one is yours <laughs> oh my goodness yeah I, I for me i i think um oh where to even begin mm -hmm. i one of the things I, I, I really want to talk about with this particular one, the fact that it's charcoal. And if anybody's tried to use charcoal as a material um, to work with, we'll know that it's so difficult to get this level of detail. The waves of the hair, the, 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 to even cast light using charcoal, I mean, this is kind of a masterpiece. If we look at the the white shirt, the detail, the stripe of the 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 necktie, the detail on the ears, the, the you know, um, the jumper. Oh, the sorry, sweater. Um, uh, just the eyelashes. Um, you know, I I had a class. I've been in class trying to use charcoal and just wanted to talk about this because mm -hmm. I wanted to just honor and recognize this artist and, and share with how much mastery um, that this this really, really takes as well. Charcoal gets everywhere. It travels all over the paper. You know, it, it's hard to create light and, and shade and, and, and stuff like that. So I really wanted to talk a little bit about material um, with this particular piece, the eyebrows, the eyelashes. The frown. The, the frown. The, the slight frown. 
Yeah, you, you can almost see the follicles, the hair mm-hmm. follicles uh, uh, on the head. So, yeah. Remy, do you think it's watercolor paper? That's really hard to say. Yes, yeah. I think it looks like it would be watercolor paper. Yeah. Um, but again, I don't really know very much about the history of paper and what would have been available mm. at the time, you know, and the quality of charcoal. Because again, I think Dimitri was talking about, you know, the things that we have available to us right now from our art supply store that is mass produced and, mm. and pressed for us and different sizes of charcoal and things like, I, who knows, you know, they were probably breaking off their own tiny pieces of charcoal and etching and uh, I just look at the lips I mean you just want to kiss them (laughs) sorry all right all right Remy we're gonna have to move (laughs) that's enough okay that's but but you know but before we move on again though like you know just to kind of go off of Hayden's piece you know Lois uh Mayu Jones is someone who is well known for incorporating African masks into her work. And, yep. you know, I think that's what we know uh, of her work. And to to see this other side of the artist of like, okay, you can c- capture someone's likeness as if they're actually standing right in front of me. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the choice of the geometric uh, pieces that she's most known for um, was a choice. Um, yeah. and, and it's not because she did not possess extreme technical skill. It's, and we have another piece of her. So I think we're gonna, we're, that's definitely gonna be the, like the one we just looked at um, with the janitor painter. How much, um, it, we're gonna move a little bit from drawing and painting and looking at woodcut. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think um, while while folks while folks are are taking in this image and kind of thinking of what it is, I want to go through a really quick um, you know story of who William H. Johnson is because I didn't know who he was before, um, and I think a lot of folks don't know who he is. So um, he was born in South Carolina, um, moved to New York City at the age of seventeen. Um, his, his family was not wealthy. Um, and so he got a job in New York City and um, was able to pay his way into the National Academy of Design, which was a prestigious school in New York at the time. Um, as soon as he graduated, he moved to France um, and spent the 1920s in France um, learning about expressionism and emotional paintings. Um, this they, they, no one knows what date this this piece is, so mm-hmm. it could be from many phases of his life. So anyway, um, in nineteen, and then he traveled all around North Africa, all around Europe during um, his time in Paris. And so he's this he's this artist that has so many different styles. So I know we'll see another one of his works, and and they look completely different from each other. Mm-hmm. He married a woman that he met that was Danish, and they traveled around like took a bike ride from France all the way to Denmark. And in Denmark, he starts to like get interested in primitivism, um, which is like going back to, you know, before the, the Renaissance and, and um, everything and showing humans in their ideal settings in nature. Um, and because of World War II, him and his wife had to move back to the United States um, because of the um, impending war that was coming on. Well, anyway, a few years after that, she dies and he goes into a depression and, and spends the remaining 23 years of his life in a mental hospital. Oh, so wow. all, of his, all of his work while he was in a mental hospital was in a storage that because the bill wasn't being paid, all his work almost ended up being um, sold off. But his friends came in, they rescued the work. Um, and then the Smithsonian American Art Museum was able to take it, take all the work. And so there's thousands of, of uh, pieces made by this, this artist over his lifetime that really didn't see the light of day. So now we have thousands of, of works that we, that's why this is 1930 to 1945. We have no idea. It was mm. just part of his body of work. Um, he was this really cool guy that liked to travel around with his wife and experience different places and cultures. And as such, his style changes a lot. 
um, depending on where he's at in the world. And for me with this wood black print, like when I first saw it, I didn't like it to be honest with you. Are you um, serious? I, it's one of my favorites. I, all, yeah, I, 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 I think there was just something weird to me about not being able to see the eyes that just kind of oh. like bothered me. Mm -hmm. um but but just kind of thinking about like with, with him he's he was really interested in spirituality and primitivism and even though this is a self-portrait you can't like for me I, I feel like you have to see the eyes to be able to see the person mm -hmm. and um you know learning about him I, I feel like maybe he intentionally didn't you know do the extra print with the with the eyes in there to really stand out because he wants to kind of be an everyday man now i know everyone else has different interpretations of this um but yeah i got really fascinated by this and 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 today i think i i showed you before this um a He's portrait tortured. of him yeah this guy was like ex I mean, he was like a, he's extremely handsome, very, very good looking guy. And that doesn't convey itself in this, in, in this self-portrait. And I think it has a lot to do with him wanting to strip himself of materiality and, and get to the essence of, of who a person is um, without all the glitz and the glamour. That, that's going to be my interpretation based off of, mm. you know, what I've learned from his life. And that makes sense. And did you did you tell me, Dimitri, that that he was a seaman or he was he was some a sort sailor. of sea like this guy was okay. This guy, as someone needs to make a movie about him, write a book. <laughs> this guy was so incredibly fascinating, mm -hmm. you know. And then I think also like the other, a lot of artists left the left America, mm -hmm. went to Paris because then it didn't matter what your skin color was, you know. People, there's just a different sense than than. America at that time or even now I mean I don't know what it is like at this time but at least in the you know 1930s um, black folks could go to Europe and folks were just interested in who you were so he experienced this freedom and then he you know traveled all around the world of just being himself and not being tied down to Jim Crow and you know the, the racist oppression that a lot of African Americans had to contend with. Wow. And it just, you know, for some reason, it just reminded me of uh, Miles Davis when he came back from France, he spent some time in France. And when he came back, he fell into depression, basically, and he named it. He was just like, well, you know, I, I it's such a shift in identity and a constant reminder of um, of how you know, you're not welcome as a full human being in the United States, but in Paris, things were different at the time, uh, apparently. So yeah, that's, it's just so fascinating. And with this one, I, th I feel like he's wearing a sailor hat or something because that mm -hmm. blue, um, mm -hmm. that blue is just, yeah. And the, and the, 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 the little neck chief thing that he's wearing, it looks like he's mm -hmm. got something around his neck that feels very, of the sailor attire, let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, as well. I really love this piece as well. I love the blue, this kind of indigo type mm. blue going on. Um, I think it's a beautiful piece. But I do also think it's very interesting, your comment, Dimitri, about talking about whether to see the eyes or not to see the eyes and what that does for us as the viewer. Um, and then what that does for the, you know, the one that's being viewed. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you also, I, I'm familiar with lin linoleum cut, but I've never worked with wood cut. Um, how, what is the process like? Is it kind of a similar process? Or? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's the same thing where you're gouging out the shapes from the wood and then yeah. whatever stays on the top is what receives the ink. So, okay. you know, carve down the places that you don't want the ink to. So get. linoleum is kind of like the, the, easy, the easier Okay, that's. I wonder where the blocks are. I wonder if I, I would love to see the block. Right, of this one. wouldn't it be yeah. so neat mm. to see it? It would be mm. amazing. Okay. Yeah. Would you okay. believe that this is the same guy? <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's totally the same guy. And I would even think that you know that that block print was probably from an earlier period than this one. This is okay. um, 
I believe, I want to say that this is probably around um, actually the time that he is returning to the United States, or I guess he's in Denmark at this time when he makes this one. And I wish Charlie was here because, you know, the more that I looked at it, I started to think of El Greco. And um, if folks are familiar with the way that El Greco has these long figures and they're a little obscured, but then he, again, 1929, this is him knowing, you know, he's, he's, had just come from Paris at the time. And again, cubism is all the rage at, at that point. Um, and so, you know, I think he's he's kind of, again, like experimenting a little with cubism where we, we see parts of the face that we, you shouldn't see when someone's turned that way. Um, and again, that elongated um, figures like El Greco did. He became really interested also in religious art. I think you said that about Hayden's work. Mm -hmm. Um, as well of, of really thinking about religious iconography. And so that's also what makes me think like he would have to have known who El Greco was, who did a lot of these, you know, paintings of, you know, Jesus Christ and the saints and, you know, all this religious iconography. And it feels like he's kind of pulling that mm -hmm. into his work. And like the other, like some of the other works like this, this could easily be a painting that someone, an artist made today. And I would totally believe it. It's mm. extremely contemporary. Um, and, and I think, you know, he's he's not obsessed with any prescribed movement of the time. He's kind of borrowing from here and there and making his own um, image. And again, it's a self-portrait. It's slightly grotesque. <laughs> it doesn't look like him um, from when you see the portraits of him. Um, but, you know, I think that also goes to his his um, fascination, fascination with primitivism and spirituality and trying to get to, you know, who he was at the core and not just the surface level. Mm -hmm. There's a whole little Dali-esque type thing going on uh, as well. Yeah, for sure. You know, and I just—I also sorry, really, sorry, Remy, go ahead. I th I think again for me the use of the colors here that he's pulling from the the iconography because you know when you see pictures of the saints and Jesus and the family you see these reds and burnt oranges and you know like there's this some of these colors are for me associated with hellfire you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying with it like in in those religious paintings of you know, smoke and hellfire or, or whatever. And the way he pulls those oranges um, and also uses those oranges and yellows to depict to, to his own skin color, I think mm. is really interesting as well. Because yeah. he obviously has blacks and browns, but he chooses, you know. And I had not noticed that urge until now. Kind mm -hmm. of, yeah. The cauliflower ear. The cauliflower, the elf here. Yeah. Um, and yeah, uh, let's just take it all in. <laughs> this one is, this one is such a good piece. This is such a, um, I think people of the diaspora, we know what that is. We right, know. That, 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 that. <laughs> diaspora lean with the hands on the hip <laughs> just about to say whatever is on our mind which is, <laughs> can I give you a piece of my mind right now such yeah. a gentle gentle mm. gentle um soul and a delicacy that that this is been put together you know the very light touches of the necklace and the flowers of the of the blue dress i just think it's just so beautiful. I mean, one of the things I think has been consistent looking at all of this work is just shows how much technique around lighting, Yeah. you know, getting lighting. I mean, and I think even today, photographers find it hard to get lighting right for our skin. So to actually be able to paint and get lighting for our skin must have been even more uh strenuous and 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 need of high technical level of skill as well mm -hmm. I, it, the details the flowers in the dress and the flowers they, they just blend together it, they just as if like the petals are in the dress and 
uh, that blue with the yellow. I, I mean, it's it's that kind of like textbook complementary colors really used so effectively. And I love that about this painting. And not only that, just, just the way that she is seated, like having the dress kind of flow, kind of fill the canvas, left to right, fill the canvas. And when we talk about composition, when we talk about all of it, it's just such a complete piece for me. Um, and the necklace. And I, I almost want to see what is in the independent. I, I, I want to see what is in there. Is that a photo? Is that, is that uh, what's in the pendant of the, the necklace? Right. And I think you're right, today. I think there's, it looks like there's an image there. And I hadn't noticed that before. Um, yeah. Uh, so, but it, when you, um, when we had the close up of the dress, uh, I said, oh, it was interesting. I also like the, um, I'm sorry, did I cut you off? I didn't. Not know. at all. No, I'm, I'm, I'm really wanting to hear what you're saying. Um, I really love the combination of colors. It really, um, there's a soft light that is cast sort of uh, from her lower, uh, what it would be our left, but her right. Um, and it's a warm cast that, that highlights her skin, I guess, what, of her neck um, that I thought was a, uh, quite nice. But uh, see, uh, there's this warm yellow uh, tones that are coming in as though she's lit by the sun from some or something from the bottom you, uh, of the uh, left hand side. But I think, um, again, uh, creating beautiful uh, skin tones, just in pulling in some of the colors that we see in the flowers in, in the backdrop. Um, really, uh, the artist has um, done a, yeah. a really nice job. Yeah. I, I, the, the, the wedding ring as well. I hadn't noticed the wedding ring before. But again, I think it tells us a little bit about who she is without Mm. Very, uh, very, it feels just very understated. Mm. You know? right. yeah. And I mean, we're looking at a very prominent painter, a very prominent uh, um, uh, American painter um, here. And, you know, she, I don't think anything is wasted. I think everything has meaning, purpose, space is used in such methodical way. And we'll look at another portrait also um, of, it's, it's just, I, I think it's just such a, a, a contrast to kind of look at this one. And just to wanted to yeah. say one, Go ahead. Uh, our audience, uh, Wendy also mentioned that the low, possibly four, floor level light reminds her of Toulouse Lautrec lighting, mm. especially in the face. Yeah. Mm. And now we see the pennant again. We Not see the pennant again. Isn't that amazing? That how I saw it, I, I pretty much saw an image in there, but I don't see it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love this. Yeah. It's so dignified again. Um, and she, she like it just, it did this, there, there's her eyes are downcast slightly. Um, and she's, she's not looking at us, but it feels it just feels like she's satisfied, you know. She she's she's had a good life. She feels good about you know what she's accomplished with it, and I don't know. I, I don't know how to describe it, but that's the instantaneous uh, feel that I get from this portrait. Mm. And, and she's she's also wearing that type of shawl that we also see with. Um, Harriet Tubman wearing at the time in some of her portraits or Sedona Truth, that, that little shawl around the neck as well. Um, and her name, 
Yeah. Anna Washington. I think she has, um, I can't remember the last name, but. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's uh, Derry, D-E-R-R-Y, I, I think. Yeah, I couldn't find um, much information about the, the person. But just, I, I feel like I know this person. I feel like she's about mm -hmm. to tell me um, something without really telling me much. <laughs> just like I've lived it. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like she's in thought. Um, yeah. Sometimes even far away, you know, mm -hmm. not necessarily. You know, we have we have three really strong paintings coming. So I'm going to ask folks if I can borrow a few few more minutes of their their Thursday today. Um, but I would I, I really love to see the shadow in the back, the hair. Um, I mean, the color palette of this one is what I why I would love to see the color palette on her on her palette. Like, what was there? Mm -hmm. What did she see, use? You can see the grays and the whites and the stuff like that as well. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the shadow on, on, uh, at the back of her hair is almost like it was some kind of mirror so that you could see, you know, when they show you the back of your hair, yeah. you know, that whole shadow back there as well. It's a really interesting choice. Yeah. But, I mean, it's kind of like, uh, you know, to quote you from, from, our talks a couple of months ago is that a good photography, a good black and white photography, you can it can see color if you see it. Mm -hmm. And then I think this is in a painting. This is sort of that. That it reminds me of that. Um, I am. I can see the light. I can see the the bright light that is coming in. I can see. I don't. I, there's something about this that is rich in color without actually without only using neutral neutral colors and brown. And so I'm, I'm, um, I love the earthiness of it. And I'm, I almost see it's bright for me. It's a bright color for me. I think we lost Remy, I think she'll be back. The placing of the shadow really adds the dimension to the- Oh yeah. Yeah, it's really, um, yeah. but yeah, greens as well. And I do like the earth tones. This one, I mean, and I, I, I almost want to go back. Can, can, can I go back to this one and just show this one and hold it almost next to, Remy, you're back, yay. Uh, hold it next to the one we just looked at. And this is a self-portrait. This is proclaimed self-portrait. So we, we don't have to wonder who this might be. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a prominence almost placed on the um, statuary in the back. Assumingly, it's the uh, African. Um, but like the previous um, uh, portrait or mm -hmm. the artist uh, studio, uh, this also shows uh, maybe her interest. This is, again, the story. She has a pendant. A pouch, possibly. Mm. Is that like a pouch? An amulet? Uh, might be. Could be. Um, but her environment as well. It tells. But there's a lot going on here too. A beautiful yeah. colors in the face. She's picking up the red, so I like that. Um, and my eyes go directly to those paint brushes also like first I see this the the little figures in the background yeah. and that makes me think about you know her her interest and in, and in, in what she's so well known for is bringing in the the, the African aesthetic um, mm -hmm. but not from a primitivist view but from like this is our culture kind of view and then I start to notice I'm like those paint brushes are really well done like you love your paint brushes and it reminds me of when I was a painter and like you just you become attached to them you know they're they're an extension of you and it's how you as a painter create um, create your art you know you, you each brush does something different and you become to just love it and I, I feel like she 
you know, it's just this interesting meta thing where she's taking her paintbrush and she's painting. Sorry, I'm going to go deep into that. Oh, <laughs> just like imagining it. her, you know, painting the paintbrushes so meticulously with the paintbrushes that, you know, um, that she's representing. Um, and, and I have never seen a self-portrait of her. And I, I love this one. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you, you know, we see so like if you study art history, you're going to come across her work and you're going to see the ones with the the African masks that are so prominent and, and how she's playing with with shapes um, and dimensions within them. But, you know, just to, to, again, to see a different aspect of this artist is, is really amazing for me. Yeah. So, you know, just looking at her background as a textile designer, she kind of started out as a textile designer. And, and we also know, um, I think there, there are few artists that we know. And, and, and this one is just, I, I, can, I can almost see that, that she understands fabric and light and all those, you know, the, those kind of things. And I can almost see the, I can almost feel that the fabric of her shirt um, and, yeah, and her hair has the most detail of the entire painting is the, the hair has got, um, it's kind of like making sure that you see all the strands <laughs> for hair. So I really love this piece. It's, it's, it's such a strong piece for me. Yeah, I, you don't know. I like the color, the use of, she's explored quite a bit of color in this, in this painting as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think just overall, you know, when we as artists do self-portraits, um, you know, whether it's an exercise or whether it's to sell or whatever, uh, it's putting of what's important in the picture about yeah. ourselves. What do yeah. we want other people to know about us? Mm -hmm. And seeing her not only with her paintbrushes and that, and as Dimitri was talking about the relationship with our tools, but mm -hmm. also the easel as well. And to choose to do a self portrait of herself actually painting, you know, I, I think that is again, that re reinforcing, um, it's not easy to be an artist at any time in mm. in life, you know, through the centuries, through the times, through the ages, to choose to be an artist and have artist practice and, and learn these skills that really just take hours and hours and hours to to perfect. Um, I just thought that, that was that's interesting type of self-portrait that she's chosen. There's a question from the audience. Yeah. I hope you're okay, Remy. Uh, you finished. Um, how does this? How does Whistler's mother fit into the time frame of this portrait? I do not know. Do you, um, does maybe anyone else? Harris, in terms of the art period and and, and style. I did see that too, Marka. That the mask, the mask like paint um, shape, painted into her face. And her I just noticed it actually. Um, as we were, you know, say, looking at it. Closely. And the other thing is you mentioned the detail on the hair, but mm -hmm. if one of the statuary in the back has significant uh, hairstyle. Um, and I, I know it indicates status a lot of times, um, your, your place in society. Um, it's at some point if you are also um, age as well so if there was one in the far back on the our right oh, i see a, it yeah anyway but um does any does and she said i see a mass like portrait oh yeah you mentioned that yeah. okay whistler's mother was painted in 1871 she should have known it but she painted this in 1940 yeah, I mean, it was like 70 years later, so I don't, I, she would have known it, but I don't, I don't, I don't know if there was a connection and maybe the chair is, is the chair what she was thinking? The connection? I don't know. I was wondering if a use of color or. It's a very different color palette <laughs> than what Whistler's mother is very gray. Okay, I don't know. Interesting though. And then we see, of course, Again, I wish we had loaded more time for this one. Um, why don't we see this one? Remy, you want to lead us with, with Malvin Gray Johnson. Self-portrait. Oh, you're muted. 
Sorry no. about that. No problem. With the muting and the unmuting. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I think for me, um, I love the colors on this. I love these the sort of oranges and yellow tones, but I think the, the most interesting thing is the angle, you know, mm. the, to, to, to actually chosen to do a self portrait where you're looking at yourself from above. Yeah. Um, you know, because it's, I, I don't know that we in any time think about looking us at ourselves from above. I think it's just a really interesting, a really interesting choice. You know, um, usually self portraits are pretty much same level, eye level, eye to eye. Um, and then the, the, the masks in the background and, 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 and bringing in the, the African aesthetic there. Um, and, and another, you know, feeling in this one, sense of a lot going on, mm. the overcrowding, uh, the, the crampness uh, or confinement or, or wanting to show all of that that I own you know yeah. myself my painting in the back my 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 clothing um so yeah that's uh yeah did it so i didn't zoom in in this one because i think it's just needs to be seen sort of like this and i i i wonder remy the uh, on the very uh, my left i guess um no the, on the left side do you see a, a face as well? Or is that just me? Okay, I see a face there too. Um, and I and I I can almost see. I I don't know if if I would see a self portrait like that as 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 you were saying, mm -hmm. like looking from above. Um, and it, and look, it looks yeah. like he's about to stand up. The way yeah. you got the hand on here his leg and so that for me that sense of motion of of you know like a circumstance that either about to say something or stand up the just the heaviness of the hand on the yeah. thigh makes me wonder you know is he going to just get up and leave the the picture yeah so 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 i just like looked it up real quick um the what you see in the background is one of his most well-known paintings um, that's actually in the collection of the Met uh, Museum. Mm. Um, so, so the the two faces, it's two masks, it's two West African masks, um, and and it's it's a really well known portrait by him. And so I think also, you know, he's he's bringing that in, and then just, you know, and we 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 talked about the Victorian era like photographs and how you have to sit so long. So I think also just that, you know, putting his his hand his uh, hand like that is is also like stabilizing. You know, so he could really stay there long enough um, to do his self-portrait, and you know, yeah. I would imagine it was doing it with this this other hand that's holding the hat, <laughs> but while he's sitting there uh, for himself. And yeah, it's a very obscured perspective that you yeah. maybe with a fisheye lens or something you could get that this this whole stretched angle that that he's capturing. Yeah, and you know, if we if we. Uh looking at looking at the maybe not the angle but um the color palette back to William H Johnson mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um it's almost it's almost the same with this one with the kind of cubism um that's going on here but I just um the color palette is almost the same and I wonder I I, I haven't seen his um, his photo or anything I wonder what he looks like and how he's showing himself and the the oversized hand um mm -hmm. the the hands actually that are kind of oversized also and is you know talking about composition uh, but you know we have two more two more i feel like uh, folks are staying still two more to show you and then um we'll say goodbye Dimitri, you want to lead us at this one? I, I feel like you would you would tell us a lot of important things about <laughs> this one. I'm just ready for it. You know, I'm like such a nerd when it comes to these things. So <laughs> I, yeah, this 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 image has been um, attributed to CPO Moorhead, but um, there's no proof that that he actually did it. It's just the best guess that that folks have. Um, CPO Moorhead was 
an artist who um, was enslaved. He was a, he was a um, a servant, and um, his owners, the Moorheads, um, felt felt like he he had a lot of promise, and so they encouraged him to be an artist. Unfortunately, absolutely none of his work survives. Um, period. Like not one item that that people can um, say was okay. definitely his. Um, and anyway, this is a portrait that he, you know, most likely did for Phyllis Wheatley that, you know, that's kind of the best guess that we can have. And she also had a very similar story where she was, um, well, hers was a little more interesting than his actually. She was uh, born in um, the Senegambia region of West Africa and um, sold into slavery at around the age of seven. Um, and so, and bought by the Wheatleys, she was actually transported on the slave ship called the Phyllis. And so that's where her first name comes from. So her true identity, who knows? Um, it was completely stripped from her. Um, and she was, it, it says um, there, the Negro servant to Mr. John Wheatley. Um, servant was a, was a euphemistic way of saying a house slave um, during the time <laughs> and, and in Boston. And so it's interesting because, you know, I, you don't think about slavery. I don't personally think about slavery in the North um, and New England, but, you know, it definitely happened. She uh, took to English really, really fast at a very young age. And so um, her mistress of the house, Elizabeth, um, taught her to write and got her really, you know, ex into the arts at a very early age. Um, and so she wrote this amazing book of poetry, um, which at the time they, you know, the, the family tried to get printed in the United States. And we, I feel like we keep going back to this topic yeah. <laughs> because of racism in the United States. Like she even had to prove herself in front of um, Harvard scholars. Like they asked her to deliver some poetry and to write something original. And then they still were just like, no, no one's going to buy a book um, of poetry by a Negro woman. Like no one's even going to believe that that's true. So her family had to take her to um, England and in England, she was able to get funding for it. She was able to uh, write more uh, works of her poetry and then get her book published and became a number one um, selling book in the United States and around the world, actually, at the time. What's really fascinating about this image also is it's the very first image of an African-American woman ever mm -hmm. um, in art in the United States. Um, or even in England, <laughs> I believe. And um, it's the very first American portrait of a woman writing of white, black, or any other ethnicity. Um, and so it's, it is very likely she, she dedicated a poem to um, SM, um, CPO uh, Moorhead. Oh, yay, thank you. There you go. Beautiful. Um, and you know, even though this is this is a this is a print, um, it's it's very likely that it was first a pencil drawing that got translated um, into a print um, in England. And because he was enslaved, why would they give him credit for um, his artwork, right? So it's very likely that that the the portrait was done by him because she praises his work and you know the way that um, the image captures her you know, really thinking through her process as a writer. So it shows her as educated, it shows her as very thoughtful. Um, and again, the very first image of a woman um, in the United States of any um, ethnicity writing, which is, is just so wild to me. <laughs> yeah, and you know, that she, she, she has a poem that I kind of talked about last time. It was just kind of how um, showing her gratitude for coming out of Africa. And we, we did, we went back and forth because I was a little bit, you know, I was like, ouch, you know? And so she, <laughs> we talked a little bit about that. And, and I, I went into her, her other poems and there are about religious, they're religious and moral, moral and it's mm -hmm. about how to live right. And I think, um, uh, also, I think about how marketable that is, um, that could be at the time. So thank you, Dimitri. I, I had no idea. So, so I want to I I drop another thing, because you know I love the stories. Um, yeah. <laughs> so just before, just before we move on, so um, her, her book was published in, what, what year was it, 1771, I want to I say, okay. or, or 72. And um, 
a, a year later, they, you know, the, the version two of the book was published and her um, family decided to um, give her her freedom at the time. And so all the wealth from the, from publishing the books became her own after a year, um, which was, which would have been great had she not met a really kind of useless man um, who basically swindled away all of her cash. <laughs> and anyway, he ends up dying. She ends up dying in um, relative poverty. So anyway, you know, oh there, 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 there's a whole there's a whole moral <laughs> behind behind this thing. This this early uh, educated, self made uh, woman finds the wrong man and quickly falls into ruin. Oh my <laughs> which God. I thought was really interesting. <laughs> That's scandalous. Oh my God. That's often, wow. the story, that's often the story of the artist as well. It really it? is, right? <laughs> part, part of the artist's journey, you know. Yeah. And we're going to close with Horace Pippin's portrait, of course. Remy, I your love favorite. It. I love this. I think this was one of the first kind of self-portraits I, I discovered. And... Um, and I and I I really like the use of color. Like there really is an this a few colors, not overly. I love the mutedness and then the contrast with between the blue background and the, and the tie. Um, the 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 thing I also really love about this is the big lips. You know, mm. it is that the mouth is so full and so um, prominent. Um, it's for, for me it's very it's very um, simple um, and I think there's a complexity in art where sometimes things look simple and childlike it, but you don't realize the actual dexterity and intricacy mm -hmm. and how difficult it is to make something look simple and childlike mm -hmm. so this is this is why you know it's one of my favorites and uh, yeah. you know yeah I don't know what else to say about this. Particular. You know, I am looking at the shirt in the shadow and, uh, mm -hmm. to create that, that, um, and when, when you said about when we look at it, it's simple, but there's mm -hmm. so many things that are complex and mm -hmm. kind of deeply thought, um, thought about to me. Yeah. And it, it, it's interesting because he has a portrait of his wife as well. Oh, well, in, the, in this style? In this style. Oh, wow, okay. And, and almost, almost using very similar colors is as mm -hmm. if that it was a he and she type twin set oh. of, of portraits, which, it, which fascinates oh, wow. me. You know, I didn't realize how uh, the different the difference between the face and the neck, the two different browns, the reddish mm -hmm. brown, and then the the kind of the white toned brown. Um, I didn't realize, and that's that's the thing about this portrait. I think um, there's so many things as you look closer. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love. I just love the you know the hairline, mm -hmm. and again all the details. It's almost like you can see every single strand of hair. And, and I think, you know, again, it would be just so easy to just do a black shape to represent mm. the hair, but taking the time to almost like digitally put every hair where it's in its place, whether it be on his head or the into the eyebrows, you know, yeah. the, 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 the 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 non fear of painting himself with full lips and the wide nostrils and you know just getting getting himself yeah. uh, it just strikes me as somebody who kind of really knew his own face and you know that signature too you better know who did it <laughs> it's oh, that yeah. kind of yeah. it's that kind of signature and the, you know when you said the hairline um, I, I kept on thinking there is an image of uh, President Obama kind of like this. It just yeah. reminds me of that so much. And um, I do, you know, I, we do have to go because we've kept everyone till then. I'm, I'm sure you enjoyed it. 
And I would like to ask everyone, actually, although it shows that um, we, we, you can support us by donating, there is another way of donating us, and that is becoming a member. If you become a Sestini member, we will continue to have these programs. We will continue to exist. And so I would like to ask uh, folks to think about becoming members. And if you want to give a one-time uh, support, you can scan that you, you can scan this or go to our website and you can donate or you can text um, and donate to this program so we come back every two weeks um, and I do want to thank our our sponsors and individual donors we do this because of you and we do this because you support us and I do want to thank all of the docents, I appreciate it. I, I as always I appreciate my time with you and we'll be back in a couple of weeks Hold on tight and we will um, let you know what we're bringing. Okay, everyone, thank you so much and have a good, um, good Thursday evening. Hey.